recording button has been pressed, so I guess that means we're going to start. Thank you, everyone on the panel and also in, uh, on the attendee side of the screen. This has been an incredible day. Um, I'm incredibly encouraged and uplifted that we were able to keep this energy up since day one all through to day four now and i'm very happy that we're continue that we're concluding with some of the same faces that we saw on day one in our in our final panel for the symposium uh today so with that i also want to give a shout out of course to dr jacoby wilson who is not with us uh physically well virtually but uh but he's very much here with us in spirit he is um taking care of himself and his family in their time of loss right now. So I ask that you send your, your thoughts and, and positive vibes uh, down to South Carolina where, where he is now. Uh, he's here. Sorry, is he here? Yeah. Oh. He says he's here. Oh, okay. Well then I'll go ahead and promote the panelist. <laughs> no, you can't stop to call me. <laughs> I was gonna say. That would be surprising. Here, here in what capacity, Dr. Wilson, <laughs> is my only question. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead and run the show. I just got, I just got back from the memorial. Okay, well, we're happy to have you here. Um, thanks for joining in, but definitely don't feel obligated. Okay. All right, so with that, this is our final session of the symposium. Uh, we'll be speaking, we'll be hearing from some giants in the field of, of environmental science. And so I'm very happy to, to introduce uh, Adrian, Adrian Hollis of the Union of Concerned Scientists, Patrice Sims of Earth Justice, Leslie Fields of C the Sierra Club, Khalil Shahid of the Natu Natural Resource uh, Defense Council, uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali of the National Wildlife Federation and Tamara Tolls O'Laughlin of 350.org. Uh, and we will be talking about JEDI 2.0, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the Environmental Movement today. So thank you panelists for joining us. Um, I wanna start with a little bit of background on your organizations. Um, and your personal duties, uh, and specifically how they affect or, or relate to Jed, this concept of JEDI and these principles. What brings you to the specific aspect of EJ and environmental work, and why is JEDI important to you all? So with that, I'll open it up with you, Leslie. Well, thank you so much, um, Jim Michael. Thank you for this invitation, Dr. Wilson, and to these great friends. We're not just colleagues. Um, we are all really good friends and uh, I feel very blessed that I'm able to do this work and have um, these folks all around um, and also supporting environmental justice communities. And thank you all for attending this conference and pushing through and I'm um, honored to be on the last panel. And so, I mean, I, I love EJ so much because as some people have heard me say, um, I get to meet the best people, work with the best people. I'm here now with some of the best people in the world. And it's taken me all over the world because it's about people really supporting and um, lifting up and um, really being and, and trying to, and, and protecting their environment. Um, and so I got started many in the early 90s um, first in law school, doing farm worker advocacy. And then when I moved out to Texas, I was volunteering for the NAACP. And um, we were just, I got thrown into the toxics work. I was looking at school siting issues and um, one thing led to another. And I've been able to try to cobble a career um, out of this work. And I've met incredible people, like many of the people who are um, watching this conference. And so, the, um, you know, in terms of JEDI, I mean, it's, it's not just about integrating this movement. It's about, it's about the regular environmental groups who we all work for. It really is about uplifting and also the um, promotion of the communities who have the solutions. And they just have not historically been 
um, recognized of having the solutions, they've not been resourced, um, and they are all solution oriented. And so um, I just got pictures on Facebook from our good friend Hilton Kelly, because they are just cleaning up again from yet another hurricane down there in East Texas and uh, Louisiana. And so, the, you know, that the, the multiple, multiple factors that um, our good friend Renise Miller Travis has lifted up this word syndemic um, affecting our communities is um, really manifest in this threat multiplier of the climate crisis. So in order, so in my organization, we started working on environmental justice issues in 1992. And um, we also started through my program, a voluntary environmental racism course, dismantling racism. We have moved along and I'll talk more about that later, but um, in order to the, in order for the environmental movement writ large to survive and to thrive and to, and to address these important issues that really are, you know, totally where we live, work, play, and worship. It is the environmental justice communities um, that need to be leading the way. And um, I like to think that I'm doing what I can to support those communities. Thanks. <clears throat> um, going over to Adrian. Yes. Um, so I got started, I suppose, in EJ when I was in, um, you know, two different things. Um, one, when I was growing up, two different events. I won't go into those. Um, I'll just say one of them was the first time I saw a Klansman at a rally. And um, my mom, of course, um, had been telling us, she's a teacher, about, um, uh, you know, explaining to us some of what we saw, the inequities that we saw growing up in Mobile, Alabama. But, um, and then going to HBCUs like Jackson State, home of Deion Sanders, I'm oh, sorry, um, and Meharry Medical College, um, you know, you learn to do more to be thought of half as good. And then when I got to Harvard, I re remember my first foray into this was I was walking down the hall with um, animal feed and this professor, I'm gonna say, um, because I had on jeans and I was carrying a garbage bag of animal feed, started yelling at me because I didn't empty his garbage. So that was sort of like a, 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 a wake up call that at the end of the day, it sort of like drove home that at the end of the day, first thing people see is your skin color. So it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, it, nothing else matters, right? And from that, I did my first study looking at the targeting, um, it was at targeting and advertising between cigarette smoking and how they targeted um, black youth compared to white youth and even in the placement of signs and the messages at the sign. So that was my first foray. And then from that, the, of course, first national people, um, um, not people of color conference and um, at Union of Concerned Scientists, one of the things that um, I suppose um, well, we've been sort of focusing on um, this a group within uh, climate and energy in particular is partnerships with communities. And that's something that, you know, we've all been, we all know the importance of it. You know, everybody in this, in this group and, and outside this group and just really pushing that um, at the Union of Concerned Scientists um, and in other organizations too, that we need to be partnering now more than ever and get rid of all the silos and just work together better. So that's sort of like my um, foray into this. So thank you. Thanks, Mustafa. Yeah, I think we all have very similar stories. I've been doing this work, you know, since I was a student. You feel like you've been doing it your whole life. I mean, if you're serious about it, and all the folks who are on this um, call are very serious about it. The leaders, you know, who represent maybe organizations and networks are serious about it because it is a lifelong commitment. Because if you think you're going to do it for one or two years, um, then you're, you know, you're probably going to be disappointed if you think that that's the totality of the investment that you have to make. And the difference between the environmental justice movement that we all find ourselves a part of and other movements is that in many instances we're doing it because it's about saving our, our lives, the lives of those that we care about, the communities that we come from. So it's not a job, 
It's not, you know, something that you can do or not do. You know, it is literally about life and culture, right? You know, and, and the seriousness of it is, is that from the first time Europeans made it to these shores, they were beginning to manipulate uh, both of those, whether intentionally or unintentionally. You know, the genocide that was happening of our indigenous brothers and sisters, the intentionality of putting blankets in those communities that they knew had smallpox and other things that decimated folks, moving folks off of their traditional lands and away from their traditional foods, bringing African slaves to this country uh, to do the most dangerous work. You know, that was taking away people's life and at the same time also eroding culture. And then telling folks you need to assimilate into this process that we have um, if you want to be able to not just survive, but you know, also be able to kind of just navigate all this foolishness that we find ourselves in. And if you look at our Asian brothers and sisters as well, you know, many of the folks who are on this call have talked about, you know, how, and I'm glad that Sokovi's on there, so he'll be able to appreciate what I'm about to say, you know, how we pimp people's pain or we pimp a process or we pimp policy, all of that has come together to bring about these environmental injustices, this environmental racism that we find going on that we've all dedicated our lives to. So the reality of the situation is, from the time most of us came out of the womb, we were working to address the institutional racism that exists, the environmental racism that exists, because as Leslie said, it is um, connected to everything that we do, you know? So um, it's a blessing to be able to work on these issues um, for it to be a part of our life missions um, and to be surrounded by so many incredible folks. And I'll close out with this, because if you look at all these uh, brown faces that you see today, we would not be able to deal with all of the challenges that we have seen if we did not have a family that was surrounding us. Because the organizations maybe that we worked in, whether it was a government organization or a nonprofit or whomever it might, or an academic institution, were never set up to be supportive of us. So all of us have always had to lean on each other in those times when we were pushed to the limit on the mental health side, on the spiritual side. Um, and if it wasn't for all of us, knowing that no matter how hard it got, there was always somebody who had an ear and a set of suggestions about how to navigate it because some of them had already been through it, we wouldn't be here today. Or at least I can speak for myself. I don't wanna speak for the other brothers and sisters. I know I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't had that support from them. Yeah, and I'm seeing everyone else nodding in agreement. So I, I don't think there's any issue with you, with you speaking on that point. Uh, Patrice, can you chime in? Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, one of the things is I, I view myself uh, among this amazing cohort of folks on this, on this panel as the relative newcomer to, to environmental justice work. I've, I've only been focused on it for the past 15 years or so. Um, and, 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 and Leslie, I see you chuckling over there. She was there at the, the moment of my introduction, um, at least on the ground to, to environmental justice um, focused uh, 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 work. You know, I, I came to this area um, not through activism, but through the law. Um, you know, I had a career before lawyering that, that was entirely disconnected from what I do now. Um, I came to the law and uh, knowing that I wanted to be engaged in, in public service, in giving back and in empowering communities. Um, and I didn't know what that was going to look like. Uh, I ended up becoming an environmental lawyer and joining EPA and, and, and learning about environmental law, um, never having studied it in law school um, uh, at, at EPA and in the Office of General Counsel. Um, you know, I was, I was there for a number of years and, and left and ended up at an NGO. And as timing would have it, ended up at starting that NGO two weeks after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and almost immediately, I was introduced in the most dramatic fashion one can imagine to about the most horif horrific examples of the consequences of environmental racism. As uh, myself and, and Leslie and a few other colleagues um, working at the organization I was with at the time, uh, headed down to, to, um, to, 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 to New Orleans 
and 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 Mississippi and, and started meeting with the communities trying to understand what was going on really appreciating not just what the impact of the storm was but what the neglect and the intentional miss uh, uh, you know exclusion from environmental protection and from the the, the connection to the very um, critical elements of participation in their own well-being they'd suffered from for so long and how that was playing out in a way that was displacing tens of thousands of people, killing thousands of people, um, and tearing families and communities apart. Um, so after an introduction like that, I think as, as Mustafa was saying, there's no way to close your eyes to what this work is about. There's no way to say, oh, that was interesting. Now I'm gonna go on and do some other stuff and forget that this is happening. And so from that point on, um, you know, a piece of every day of my work has been thinking about what does this mean for communities that are struggling with the, with the consequences of racism and the consequences of disproportionate burdens from uh, uh, environmental, um, environmental pollution and other things. Um, I moved on, of course, at that point, uh, you, you know, motivated by, again, some of the themes that we're talking about today. I had at that point been in my career for about uh, 10 or 12 years as an environmental lawyer and realized, you know, holy cow, I've seen about, um, you know, a, a number of brown faces in the meetings that I've been in and the decision-making rooms that I've been in over the course of that 10 years that I could probably count on one hand. Um, and I left the NGO community for that reason and went to Howard Law because I realized that, that we needed to have lawyers, powerful minds, powerful energy, powerful personalities doing this work and understanding why it was so critically important. And there had to be people there in the formative stages of, 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 of those people's development, um, helping, helping folks to understand, hey, there's something that has to be done and there's a role for you if you want to play it um, in, in, in the context of the law. And I spent a, a fantastic um, six years at, at Howard Law, and I'm, I'm delighted to now see many of my former students are out there doing amazing work and doing great things. And I know others on this call can, can attest to, to having similar experiences. And, and I'll, I'll stop by saying now I find myself as a VP of litigation uh, for healthy communities at, at Earth Justice. And I now get to work every day with incredible teams of lawyers and help to put those teams of lawyers to work for communities around the country. And there's nothing more satisfying than seeing uh, us get to the end of a case on behalf of the community and, and, and see the change that happens as a product of, of the legal work that we have the, we have the chance to do. Thank you, thank you. Tamara. Thank you. This is a broad ranging conversation already on question number one. Uh, so I'm Tamara Tolzo Laughlin. I'm the North America Director at 350.org and most importantly in this political moment of 350 action. So, so I get to yell about the horrifying uh, state of our politics, which is like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, uh, I have been in this work for 20 years, so half my life, I'm 41, so a little more than half my life. And uh, in doing that, I bounced around every three years for the last 20 so years, uh, doing parts of jobs in almost every kind of environmental outfit that exists, because uh, most of them will crush you if you stay there for too long. So, so in my experience before this moment where we were all delivered here, I tried everything at the buffet in almost every configuration. Can I stay here and care about my people working on lead issues? Uh, can I work in tribal space in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming, uh, just trying to help tribes make sure that the buildings they were given by government didn't spoil them, um, uh, despoil the land, destroy them, expose them to chemicals that killed them, and belong to no one because it fell in a legal limbo. Um, uh, I started off my career at the Department of Environmental Protection in New York City, which is uh, a, a regulator of natural resources, water, and a utility. <laughs> so uh, there's some real inherent conflicts in that sort of thing. Uh, so some of my work inside of green NGO space was specifically about uh, helping NGOs who were trying to figure out well, how is that possible? 
when you have to choose between making a buck and uh, providing a resource to people, which one do you choose? So uh, beyond being a person who was raised by a spiritual guide and a woman who was a water protector and a man who was a community police officer so much so that the entire community extended his funeral by almost a day to stand in a room and talk about how uh, he knew their mother and grandmother and they didn't know what jail was like because he knew everything about their community. I'm just a hybrid of people who raise their families, who love their children, and my blackness is not special. Uh, it is a function of what happens when we're left to be raised uh, in our own context and not decided um, by other people, whether we get to live and eat and pray and play and have that be interfered with other people's determinations about what we're worth. So. Uh, justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion means a lot to me. The E is my most favorite letter. Um, and, part of, and part of why that's true is because it involves the movement of people and resources. And that's the stuff that'll get you killed if you do it right. Um, uh, people uh, talk about all the great things that we need to do, but part of how I ended up at 350 was because they were asking good questions, not because environmental organizations don't make all kinds of mistakes that ruin people's lives, that they have not extracted from communities, that they did not put emissions before people as though bears could save us from climate change. Every kind of mistake that we could make, including excluding our own communities, deciding that people of color didn't have something to offer. I have seen it. I have experienced it. I have been a part of communities uh, where we came by and asked uh, uh, how people are doing, but not how they got there. So it's really important for me that we focus on equity and that that's raised in the space of nonprofit environmental organizations because that's how we move from being a um, photo op to being the strategists that run the work, the people that bring in the expertise, the ones who connect with community and make sure that that's not an extractive exchange. Uh, so really, uh, it's incredible because without justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we will have no framework to raise that. We would have no, people would just say, well, you were in the photo. We went to your community. I got the t-shirt. <laughs> I came and went and saw. So if we didn't have uh, inclusion as a way that we work, if we didn't push for diversity, although I would argue it's the lesser of the, of the items and should be the result of equitable work, of inclusive work, of work that's focused on justice, um, I don't know that that we would be here. So I am proud to feel like I'm just hanging out with my family in this conversation because each of us has played many different roles to get to a place where we could work together as equals. And not, and not on behalf of other folks, but on behalf of ourselves and every part of our identity. Um, 350 is not um, free of all the sins that nonprofit organizations quit have made. It's just only 11 years old. So, so in the span of time that we've been screwing things up, it isn't old enough to have done some of the, the worst things, but it's, you know, give it some time. Uh, all things being equal, 350 is also fairly middle-aged because we weren't born five minutes ago and we don't have hundreds of years of, of extraction in our history. So asking questions around what does it mean to have 80% uh, of your leadership? My, I'm the North America director, 80% of my team is Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Like that's a thing that has never happened before. So there are experiments. And the piece of it that is uh, weighing on me in this moment is how do we determine how we will work together when there are levels because we've never been able to work where we've had where we are in multiple seats of power how do we operate when we're not operating through the gaze of white leadership what does it mean for us to struggle in a principled way and figure out how to disagree when the things that are happening around us patriarchy sexism racism are also happening so it's a challenge that i think we'll continue to pursue because every time we've ever gotten here america's been restarted so by my count, we're almost at America 3.0 because, because we're in money, because we're in science, because we're in climate, because we're in justice work. And when we start talking to each other, America starts all over again. So by my watch, we'll see if we can make it through the end of this hour. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, Khalil, I, I haven't done you any favors by making you go last, but based on how much you post to the environmental professionals of color, uh, <laughs> I know you've got some fire for us, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, you ain't doing me no favors making me go out to, uh, tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and then I'm, yeah, make the assumption about fire. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, y'all. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming on and signing on on your Saturday afternoon uh, uh, to be a part of this conversation. Um, I, and, 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 and this is, you know, 
I love and admire everybody on this panel. Uh, and, you know, the short answer of, you know, what this means and why I'm here are really the people on this panel, both literally, you know, figuratively, uh, you know, in inspiration, in working together. Uh, so th this is, is just amazing. Um, you know, how I got to this was really by accident. You know, I, I was, you know, you know, in New Orleans, I was, you know, a community organizer doing like a lot of youth advocacy, um, you know, economic justice work. Um, and there was a moment uh, where, you know, I had to make a decision. I was either going to uh, get a unit in the Calio housing project where I was organizing and, 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 and doing work. And I was going to live back there full time and do that work. Um, and, uh, you know, some tragedies happened. Uh, you know, a couple, of the, a couple of the brothers that I was working with uh, were murdered. Um, another brother that I was working with got picked up on some cases from, you know, decades ago. Uh, you know, I, I, I was getting pulled into uh, NOPD headquarters, uh, you know, for questioning um, because I put flyers up all over the project about, you know, know your rights. You know, what happened if the police come to your door? What happened if, if the police pick you up on the street? Um, and I put my name and phone number on it. <laughs> so they picked me up and asked me why I was putting this stuff around the project as if people in the project don't have a right to know what their rights are. Uh, so, you know, but, but, you know, in, in that moment though, I had to rethink and question, um, you know, the work that I was doing and whether the work that I was doing, you know, was putting, you know, my people who are already vulnerable, uh, to police violence, uh, in more harm's way from police violence. Um, so I had to, you know, to rethink that and by a stroke of chance, uh, I had, I had an offer to go work with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, uh, in Epps, Alabama. Um, and I spent two years out there as a community land specialist, um, you know, and I wanted to learn, you know, from those communities, you know, just to get, you know, a juxtaposition, you know, from living in the city, living in rural communities, you know, what rural economies were like compared to what, you know, cities were like, what rural poverty was like compared to poverty in the city uh, and what was going on there. Um, but, what I, but what I really learned, which is working with those black farmers, was what it meant to have a uh, black southern land ethic. Um, you know, to be connected to the land, to know the land, to understand the land. Um, you know, I, I, I met I met black farmers who planted by the cycles of the moon. Um, you know, uh, I met I met farmers. You know, we were we were organizing the first farmers market uh, in Alabama, and we we're trying to figure out you know how we were going to stagger the production cycle. You know, of all these farmers, so that you know we always had crops um, in the farmers market. And you know we had come we had come with, with with maps and like a calendar and all of this plan and the farmers took over the meeting because they knew the elevation of the entire region they knew when the rains fell all over the region and and, and they knew when it was okay you 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 plant in, in March you plant and so they planned it all out because because they knew. You know, they had the, eco the ecological wisdom from working the land for, for so many years, for so many generations, you know, they knew. Um, and so I learned from them, you know, that appreciation and, and understanding of our connection back to the earth. And when I went back to Louisiana, it made me, made me look at my own home, you know, a little bit differently and understand, you know, particularly, you know, being from New Orleans and, and being connected to, to that soil and, and that culture and what that means. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, you would think that, you know, Hurricane Katrina, uh, you know, was, you know, the big thing, but it really started there in Alabama. Um, and when Hurricane Katrina hit, I was actually uh, in India, uh, you know, doing um, my master's program uh, and, and, and working with uh, Dalit communities, uh, you know, in southern India that, that were dealing with, uh, you know, the construction boom in Bangalore that was stripping their topsoil uh, to feed in, into the construction industry. So I was seeing this this conflict between rural communities, poor communities, and you know, heavy construction uh, in, in 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 urban cities, and so and, and in the midst of all that, you know, Hurricane uh, you know Katrina happened, um, you know, destroyed my home, and 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 for the first time, I felt homeless, uh, you know, displaced, with really with no place to go, uh, you know, even though I still had a whole country necessarily, you know, you know that I was a citizen to, you know, without New Orleans, no place in America is home. Um, so, you know, I came back to New Orleans, uh, you know, to start, you know, helping uh, with the uh, recovery there. Um, and, you know, 
went back to school, did you know doctorate, and eventually ended up here with uh, with uh, NRDC. And what I've learned here, and, and when you think of what, and when you talk about you know Jedi justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know it really reminds me of you know this conversation that we have about race in this society, where white people like to other people of color, where you know where you know the topic of race, culture, and ethnicity that's that's for you others. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of our conversations, we do that to the EJ movement. You know, the EJ movement is this very parochial thing. It's this very specific thing, you know, for those people. You know, who we are is the mainstream environmental, you know, movement. And in the same way in our, in our race conversations, white people never have to identify themselves. They never have to identify what culture you belong to, person. Um, you know, you know, who, you know who, who, who you represent. Um, the quote unquote mainstream environmental movement, you know, they avoid having to identify who they are, um, who they serve. Um, you know, being in um, a, a majority white institution, and again, you know, have, having all of these folks on this panel reminds me of, of the first time I took a job in New Orleans with a, with a majority white nonprofit organization. Um, and I was hosting uh, a, a community gathering of sorts. Um, and Mama Suma, uh, one of our elders in New Orleans came to this meeting and I was like, Mama Suma, why are you here? And she said, because I want these people to know that you don't come here alone. You have constituency, you have people behind you, you have power behind you. Because you may not know who, they, who, who, who these people are, but I know who these people are. Um, and so, and that's who each one of these people on this panel represent, you know, and, you know, the, and the, you know, communities that we come from. And, you know, the mainstream environmental movement, they can't say that. They can't tell you what community they represent. They, they can't tell you, you know, what people they represent. You know, all, you know, all they can tell you is, you know, spreadsheets, um, you know, you know, they can tell you uh, equations and, and, and modeling, but they can't tell you anything about people. You know, and so, you know, that's what Jedi means to me. It, 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 and it's, it, it's, it's about, you know, the people who put us here, um, you know, the people who we work for, uh, you know, the people who we represent um, each and every day. And like, and, and like, you know, Mustafa said, it, it's about, you know, livelihood and culture. It's not just work. I'll stop. All right. Thank you all. We've exceeded all of our time for this discussion. So we'll be, we'll be leaving now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, thank you very much. We were on question one with so much richness and depth. Um, and I have nowhere else to be, but for the sake of, of everyone else on the panel and everyone else in the audience, um, I'm going to have to enforce the, the quick response mandate uh, here going forward. Um, because we have a lot of ground that we want to cover. So with this next question, I want to get into kind of a, a whole kind of circumspect view of these Jedi principles, this movement, this Jedi movement, uh, going reaching all the way back to 2014 with the statement of diversity and environmental organizations by Sister Dorsita Taylor. Um, now here we are in this moment, in, in this moment of moments. What do you see as the ultimate goals uh, from where we started off in 2014 with the first report on the Green 2.0 report on diversity in the workplace, in the environmental workplace. Um, how far have we come? Where still do we have to go? What are the ultimate goals of this movement and how do we get there? So I'll start with uh, Khalil. If, you, if you've been able to catch your breath, uh, I'll start back with you. Um, oh my gosh. Um, you know, the ultimate goals. Uh, you know, to me, it's it's very simple. Um, you know, I got into the environmental movement because I thought that, and I still do believe that uh, environmentalism, the in, the environmental frame, understanding that that land ethic, that it has something of value to offer to Black liberation. Um, you know, not just here in the U.S., but you know, across ac across the, across the, across the globe. Um, you know, and, and so to me, you know, this is carrying on a tradition, you know, a legacy, uh, you know, that began, you know, since the dawn of time. Um, and, and so it's, and so that to me, that's, that's always been the goal, you know, and yeah, and, and that just, and that, and that remains. Thanks. Tamara. Uh, uh, Green 2.0 was the beginning of the reckoning. Enforcement is everything. 
That's why it's the, it's the one of the few announcements that rang out of this horrifying administration's uh, hatchet-like uh, activities uh, towards our government. Like, and yelling out that enforcement is not going to happen. It was sort of a, was a, was a it was like a um, whale call. <laughs> it was very loud and shook everything. Um, I think it's really important to think about 2.0 as the moment where we started matching the storytelling uh, that is the oldest form of data to what other people can read and understand. Uh, stacking people up and having them maybe measured against one another. Filling out metrics so it's not just magic but also metrics, which means we're able to move people and resources. So it moved us towards this conversation around equity, not because it's the first time it's ever been raised, but it's because we were able to show up with the storytelling, the data, and the demands. So, so I, I, think, I think it um, was a real watershed for a bunch of things that were coming. Thanks, Patrice. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, Tamara. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that it did is it started a conversation that has not stopped. It started a conversation that's got louder, that's got richer, that's gone wider and deeper. That's an incredibly important conversation that had to, hap that had to happen. And it's now starting to do the things that Tamara was describing that are connecting to action, connecting to um, to, to, to behavior and, and behavioral change. Um, and as a product of that, you've got, a, you've got organizations doing serious work um, and hard work on, on some of these issues. Um, you've got much better transparency growing and transparency that now creates the, the potential to be able to hold people accountable. Accountability is critical. If you don't, if you don't have the capacity for accountability here, then, that, then, then what you're doing doesn't uh, it isn't going to isn't going to land. Um, there's still a long way to go. Uh, the 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 ultimate goal is a cultural shift, right? A a change in the in organizational understanding about themselves, what they are and what they do and why, um, and real compositional change, and especially change in 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 leadership and in in the in the uh, locations of power within organizations. Um, you know, I think it goes to back to what uh, Tamara was saying the, the first time she, sm she spoke, like, how do you get away from the work all happening through the gaze of white leadership? Um, and, and the answer is you change that leadership. Here, here. Uh, Mustafa, you're next. Well, I'm a bit of a historian, and I'm lucky I have even better historians who are around me. So I would say Green 2.0 built upon the March 16th, 1990 swap letter that was sent that actually called out uh, a number of the conservation organizations, things that we now call big green organizations, about a number of the things that we are now talking about again today and trying to make progress on. So I don't want folks to think that it started just in that moment where we were talking about green 2.0. It actually is built upon from other actions, other calls for humanity, not just calls for justice, but calls for humanity. Because the reality of the situation is, is that these organizations were lacking humanity because they refused to do the right things. They refused to share power. It wasn't like folks were asking them to just give up all their power at that time, but now we understand that there are new constructs that have to be in place, new paradigms, if we're gonna address these challenges that are going forward. So I would say that we also need to call out the fact of that 1990 letter that led to this work that was done at that time period and where we find ourselves today. Yes, Adrian. Yeah, so there was a time that diversity meant black. And then there was a time that diversity meant everything but black, right? So that when you look at, um, when people say, yeah, we have a diverse organization. Yeah, okay, how many black people do you have? And the answer might be two, right? And so one of the things that, one of the big pushes for me with Jedi, just like um, I think uh, Tamara said her favorite word is um, equity. You know, one of my least favorite words is the way that equity is used by some organizations. It, it wasn't equity, it was diversity. <laughs> is that, you know, diverse uh, equity does not mean environmental justice. Equity and justice are two different things that are both equally important. And I've been saying that for a while, and I'm going to continue saying it until people realize that they both are important, but you got to address the historic racism that underlies every action. And so when you talk about diversity, what do you mean? Do you mean, because we're all diverse in this, on this panel, we're diverse from each other, right? 
So when we talk about diversity, people need to be clear on what that means. And that's sort of like, uh, when it comes to Jedi principles, I want that to be a major part of it. Leslie. Thanks. Um, and I agree with all my, my friends on this. And um, also, it means, you know, the, the first report was, um, was really substantial. Um, and, um, but at the same time, Mustafa was right. I mean, it was 34 years after the Group, group 10 1990 letter. And the progress has been glacial. I think the glaciers are going to melt before, you know, and so um, we have to speed it up. And so, because, and what was significant about the report was that, you know, we all had our own anecdotal evidence. We could count on, we, could, we all can count. We've all gone to school and we could, we could count the number of these people in these organizations. And that wasn't good enough. So we actually have the data and like what Tamara said, have the data with the storytelling. Um, but also the, um, it meant that there's some accountability you know, reflecting on what Patrice said. And also to get to that accountability, we had to actually look at the way people were being treated in these organizations, the retention issue, the professional development issue. It's not enough just to um, harvest folks and bring them in and they run out screaming. And so um, a lot of work that has had, has had now has to be done in terms of professional development and retention. And like Mustafa was saying, you know, the, the human rights of, these, of the folks um, in these organizations on every level. Uh, and so now there's a report card that comes out and it's, a, you know, on these organizations. And there is a the report that comes out also in terms of there's still organizations that don't even fill out, haven't even filled out the, sur the original survey. All right. And so that's an indictment on them. They don't want folks to know. And it's a voluntary. It's, it's not like it's mandatory. And so, um, you know, we need to really look at, 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 at that. And, um, but they're not the end all be all in the environmental movement. And I, I you know, appreciate the focus of this panel, but it's, it's still that the problem is, and we'll get into, I think, late in a little bit, you know, just, uh, it's, it's not just about these organizations, it's about their, their oversized influence in policy and law and in government and the resources that they are also in control of. So it's important that we are trying to change them and change their culture because it is about culture. And sometimes we've have to, uh, the Sierra Club, we have two unions. I mean, it has been the unions which have been led by the people of color uh, and a lot of the younger people of color, my organization, that have really been the ones to change this culture and to um, make sure that we are a more humane organization. It wasn't from the top. So I really, um, and I'm proud that, um, that our unions are helping other, some of these other organizations unionize as well, because these human rights issues um, have been, you know, for far too long ignored. Absolutely. And, and I, I would urge you to actually continue on that thread because another question was, you know, the gaps that still exist. Um, and so drilling down into that, that systemic, you know, entrenched power that these organizations have and their influence uh, is definitely a, a part of that. It's something that needs to be overcome. And I see Dr. Wilson in the, in the chat has said, Tamara, talk about that money. EJ groups are receiving less than 3% of total do dollars provided by foundations. Uh, similarly, HBCUs receive less than 3% of research dollars available from federal government sources. What's going on? What the heck is going on? So I don't paraphrase phrase. Um, does anyone want to want to speak to the money issue? I can start and say that I think the changes that three percent was hard won. Every dollar of it came from activists uh, rec actively targeting philanthropy at its filthy, filthy roots. What the letter in 1990 talks about is that none of this work is done without somebody paying the cost. It comes from our communities being extracted. The history of philanthropy is uh, uh, very wealthy people expunging a vague part, a percentage of their guilt for a tax refund. And as they have done that, they have built the philanthropy, like the, the whole world of philanthropy. And usually it's tied to the thing that they, that have, they have done. Uh, BP is a good example of that. 
they own more solar panels than anybody because they caused more damage than everybody, right? So the, they owed the, uh, the Gulf a lot of debt specifically because they made their money destroying the Gulf. So when we start to think about uh, where the money comes from, how we change that conversation, it's the only, it's only the only thing that's caused a change is organizing that targeted the education of philanthropy around what it needs to do to be responsive. Uh, the next wave in that work is investing not just in an idea that forces um, our organizations to come in looking for a list to solve because they were paid to do X, but really making investments in communities and in leadership and in growing long-term accountability between these organizations and people. There is so much more to do and there's a lot more money to get, but the conversation didn't spontaneously come out of philanthropy because the revolution has always been resource. Moving that money into the right hands has been the work of organizing. Just let me just let me real quickly add also there has to be accountability in this process and lots of times folks don't want to talk about it. I got my own company. If I never work in a green organization or in the government again, I'm okay. And, and here's the reality of the situation is that if you don't put mechanisms in that demand that folks actually invest in these communities, then you are relying on, on their better angels, which sometimes seem to be hard to see. So let's start it out with you know, we're talking about big green organizations. They get their money from foundations. Some of the money comes from foundations, others from membership, some from corporate dollars, some from a couple of other places. So if they are not investing in black and brown and frontline and indigenous communities, then there has to be accountability in that, that they no longer get those dollars. Now let's go further upstream. Who is holding the foundations accountable? So if the foundations are willing to give money to organizations, that are refusing to uh, fund frontline organizations, then the foundations have as much responsibility in the overall paradigm as do those big green organizations, right? So we gotta understand the totality of this bridge, because I don't like saying the word pipeline, we got 2.4 million miles of that, we don't need no more. So let's get down to the realness of it. And here's the other part, if you are a member of one of the organizations that have membership bases, and if you are not holding folks accountable for the dollars that you are taking out of your pocket and giving to them, then you're responsible also for this false paradigm that we are operating from. And here's the last point. All of these organizations, the foundations, big green organizations and others keep saying that we have got to win on climate change. It's impossible to win on climate change if you don't win on environmental justice. It is completely impossible. And I don't know why we keep allowing this, this false narrative to float around. So if you're serious about winning on climate change, which seems to be this galvanizing force, because when black and brown people were getting sick in their communities, people weren't paying attention. But as soon as they realized that that pollution coming out of the stacks is what's driving these emissions and warming up the oceans and our planets, now, okay, now we want to get focused, then good. Let's get focused with the dollars. Let's do work like when Bernice Miller Travis was at the Ford Foundation and specifically making sure that her portfolio was investing in folks. Let's make sure like early leaders like Dana Alston and others who are pushing and fighting and, and strategizing and moving things in the right direction. And when they're not surrounded and uplifted, then their voices become weakened and their ability to actually make those portfolios grow and to make sure that that is actually embedded in the process. So all I'm saying is that there has to be accountability. And that means that we also have to be a part of that, but we also got to, Make sure, we always tell people, stop giving the fossil fuel industry your money. And then we stop with the conversation. Why don't we also say, and don't get me wrong, all of us love all the folks that we know in many of these foundations and other philanthropic organizations who are trying to do the right thing. And there is an evolution that's going on. But as was said earlier, the evolution is not fast enough if you believe what the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment Report says. If you really truly believe that, then you should be also putting as much energy in and making sure these resources are going to the places that are going to make real change. I'm going back to my cup. Can, just, can I? I yeah, just want to throw in there real quick. That also means from oil to plastics. It, uh, yes. In a whole nother moment, we could talk about that, but I just right. want to flag that. It's and so many other things. Fertilizer, yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think th this is also important, um, and I think connecting uh, the Green 2.0 to this issue of equity, right? 
Um, you know, because because to me, I don't like the term equity because equity, you know, it becomes kind of a, a you know too conceptual, too amorphous. It's, it's undefinable. You know, I like inequality. So because we can count inequality, and 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 that's where the accountability in the metrics, you know, show in Green 2.0 is showing the actual inequality within these institutions. Um, and, and, and we also know, we can see, we can count, we can measure, we can hold ourselves accountable to, we can hold our actions accountable to how they're acting to address inequality in our, in our societies. Equity, like we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on workshops and facilitators trying to, trying to define what equity means. And we still don't know. We still don't know. Because, because, because there's no way to actually implement it because, because there's nothing measuring it, there's nothing holding it accountable to anything. Um, and, and, and that shows up, you know, again, in the relationship between the quote unquote big greens and, and the EJ group who, who, you know, who often treat EJ organizations. And even when, even when we partner on projects and partner on funding, you know, it, it, it's kind of treating the EJ groups like a disadvantaged business, you know, uh, you know, contract. So, you know, we get the million dollar grant and we're going to slide you maybe a $200,000 small grant to see so you can build your capacity, you know, is what they say, you know, things like that. Um, you know, but, but, but also, you know, a big part of this and this go and, and this, you know, comes from the big greens, it comes from the foundations, but, it, but it's also uh, a fact in our politics and in the way that our Congress is viewed, because we talk about equity, we talk about justice within our organization, but there's always this line that we can never cross because justice and equity won't get you 60 votes in the Senate. And so, and as long as, as long as some smart person can come in and trot that out and say that, then there's going to be a limit to how much equity and justice they're willing to tolerate. It's going to be a limit to how much equity and justice foundations are going to be willing to fund, uh, particularly as it relates to climate change. Because, we, because if you saw from a lot of the green groups, the, the big green groups, you know, our response to the Green New Deal. Uh, it wasn't that, you know, we had a moral rejection, I'm going to say we because I'm a part of it, but that's it, uh, you, know, you know, that we had a moral rejection to, to the Green New Deal, but there, but there were many people, you know, you, you can call them climate hawks, you know, you, you, know, you can call them, uh, you, know, you know, whatever you like, but they were scared to death and still are scared to death of wedding carbon emissions to social equity. So because they believe that if we can get a negotiated settlement in climate to target carbon emissions, to reduce carbon emissions, then we can do that without addressing social equity. If you bring social equity, if you bring those black people into the Congress who are a political liability in the 60 vote Senate, then you threaten their ability to get those carbon emissions, you know, reduced through whatever green tax, uh, you know, carbon tax, whatever cap and trade, Clean Power Plan 2.0, you know, whatever it is that they would like to push forward. They, they, they are afraid to wed climate outcomes with social outcomes because they're afraid that their fragile congressional coalition is, is going to fall apart. And, well, and they're afraid to lose their power and control. No one gives up power. Nobody, nobody, nobody. It's Machiavellian and, our, and Frederick Douglass said it best. And so it is about really you know, we are trying to wrest control, wrest power, uh, and um, to, you know, and acknowledge and make sure that the people most affected, disproportionately affected, um, get that power and control to bring forth the best possible outcomes for the communities. Yeah, um, yeah I'm afraid you go on. I want to step back to something Mustafa said. When we're talking about funding. Um, Tamara had to step away, I see, but what she came to UCS and gave, a, and gave a talk. First thing she said was, this is going to be uncomfortable. And if it isn't uncomfortable, that means people aren't telling the truth. So whenever, you know, like in our blog post, you hear us talk about the um, systemic racism being the underlying factor for everything else, every other problem, right? The beginning, the root. Um, the issue is the same thing around uh, some people's definition of climate change, uh, climate justice versus environmental justice you know, we have our definitions of it. Some people think, um, this one woman told me, what are you going to do about this new thing called environmental justice? Everybody's behind climate justice, but what about environmental justice? And before I could explain, somebody pulled me away. I don't know why. But um, 
The thing is, I'm at the point where we need to, just like Mustafa said, call it what it is. We need to be recognized. When it comes to funding, I don't care what you call it. Give the money to the community. Whatever makes you feel better, you give it, to, you give it where it needs to go and where it hasn't been. We call it what you want, but we know what it is. So I just want to put that out there. If it feels like there's something missing from this discussion, it's the raucous applause that would be <laughs> in the room in, in these transition periods. There would be just standing ovations after each of you speak on these issues because it's, it's real, it's raw, it's the truth, and it's what everyone needs to be saying and needs to be hearing right now. Um, and with that, I've stalled enough so that tomorrow can get back in. So we'll go to the next question. Um, so the, the international, the now international movement for black lives uh, and the tragic killings that have mandated this movement has brought forth a widespread reckoning with, with system, systemic racism among many progressive acts that have sprung from this event um, or from this movement. Several environmental groups have openly denounced their racist beginnings and legacies, uh, specifically, uh, example, uh, the Sierra Club and John Muir. So. How has this reckoning brought to the surface racism and discrimination in, in your organization or other organization, big green groups that you, that you follow? And what changes are being made to change the culture of these organizations? Uh, and then finally, what's being done to ensure that these changes are not superficial or worse, performative? So I'll start off with Adrian. Ooh, I'm so glad you started off with me. I, I felt that one in my soul. Um, you know, at the Union of Concerned Science, I shouldn't say that, but, uh, you know, we had a, right around the time of Mr. Floyd's murder, um, as you know, some people know, we had a letter from a, a former employee that came out and it sort of underlined the systemic racism that exists in these big green organizations, specifically in the one in which I work. Um, from that, a lot has happened, is happening, because it is not done. It's going to take years to right this wrong, right? Um, you know, um, I'm, um, we have, um, we just unionized a couple of days ago, which is great. And um, thank you. Uh, um, Leslie mentioned her, the union there. They uh, have spearheaded our, um, forming our union. One of the things that we've been having is, those discussions that uh, Tamara described as uncomfortable, only they've been, I think, a whole nother level. Um, there have been tears and, um, you know, a lot of people want to do, you know, want to talk to you and talk about their own issues related to racism. And, you know, um, as we always say, there are no tears in a revolution. There's no time for that, right? Because we need to keep it moving. And, um, you know, but I think there's a place for people to recognize where they may have made mistakes. And I think some people are being, are, are really looking internally. And that's even people of color are looking at their own actions. So I think that we are at a place now that we, you know, we were headed here. We've been headed here for a long time. I don't even know why, it, I don't think that it took this long. I think that people are just realizing that they can no longer ignore it. And so what, what it has done in a nutshell um, is forced the conversation right, that people have been um, avoiding, ducking and dodging for a long time. Absolutely. Mustafa. Black and brown and indigenous folks have been dying forever, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. You may be dying slowly from what's been coming out of stacks, or even though it was actually, when folks finally started to see people actually being lynched, in this generation, it got people's attention. Our parents, our grandparents, they remember the lynchings that were happening. In our communities, folks been getting lynched by the police. Folks been getting lynched by these corporations who continually pump this stuff out that asphyxiates you, just like when the police officer put his knee on George Floyd's neck. And then they had to watch what's going on with COVID-19 and the suffocations that are happening there that are some of them that are being driven of course, by these chronic medical conditions that folks have been dealing with because of the toxic pollution that they've been taking into their bodies. So this is, is nothing new. So here is what I say we need to be doing. Uh, some of the steps are you need to make sure that your organization has a full environmental justice analysis happening. That means all your policies, programs, uh, and budgeting has to run through an EJ analysis. 
if you're not, then I think that some organizations continue to do the window dressing where they will sign onto a letter and everyone will be like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Everybody has come together to, to call out these injustices that are happening. And then people remember the letter for 15 minutes. And if inside of your organization, there's not real systemic change that's happening, then we're missing what the set of opportunities that are coming out of these tragedies are actually doing. And you know, if you're not willing to do that, then, then you're, just, you're, you're just playing games. The other thing is that, and folks have talked about this, is that folks have got to address the white supremacy that exists inside of the organizations and the fragility that, that, that comes along with that. And that also means, is even though we're very aware that there will never be true equality in relationship to power sharing, you need to know if an organization is at least making attempts at that and what that looks like and what are the accountability mechanisms that will be used to address that. So that's, you know, some of the training and other things that are necessary in diversity and the boards and senior staff and all this other type of stuff. Here's where the rubber hits the road, and then, and then I'll be quiet. If you are not building, and we're going to talk about environmental justice, if you're not building environmental justice into the performance standards of your organization for your senior level folks, your middle management folks, and, and, and newer folks are coming in, that then says, if you don't do this, then you are going to get dinged. If you do do all the things that are part of the priority setting for whatever your particular job title is, then of course, you know, you get, you know, you get bonuses, you get benefits, all these other types of things, but you have got to build accountability. And that accountability, if it's going to be good, you know, if we're really going to have a world where we're actually growing and, and moving in a positive direction, it needs to be inside of our respective organizations, it needs to be in those foundations that we talked about before, it needs to be in the government who also plays a significant role in this, That'll tell you people are serious. And then if you really get some leverage going, then we build it into some of these corporations and others who say that they are concerned about the environment and about addressing systemic racism and all these other types of things. If you don't have that, then you don't have accountability. So that's the mindset that I'm at. And folks can say, well, Mustafa, you at NWF, so what are they doing? NWF, I wouldn't have came to NWF if they weren't serious about creating a 21st century organization. So if, let's get some real talk real quick. So if an organization that has been over the years moderate at best can actually make these transformations, why can't everybody else? That's some real talk for you. Absolutely. Uh, and then what you just said reminded me of something that Tamara said where 350.org not that they have never made mistakes, but they're asking the right questions. So Tamara, what, what can you say about, about the questions and the actions of 350.org in this space? Well, yeah, the first thing I'm gonna do is take us back to just two minutes ago, 2016, when all of the big green organizations started sending out letters in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. As a part of the small team sent out by the, by the great configuration of blackness, indigeneity, and people of color, that is the Green Leadership Trust, uh, we were part of that group of people that went into the boardrooms with the CEOs of the green groups and watched some of them be stone cold, not giving a damn. Some of them break down in tears at the sheer weight of the truth that we were saying that this is your work. And if in your work you are failing and people are dying, how can you call yourself a professional? Like forget whether or not you care about us as human beings. If your work is water and people are being poisoned by things that could easily be stopped by you doing your job, then you have killed these people. So I just want to like say that some of this has been brewing for a very long time, but there have been some flashpoints in, in, um, in the last 15 years, and 2016 was a real moment. Part of the reason why all of those letters came out is because what we said to them was that you have no right to act like it is the fault of oppressed people that you're not in right relationship with them. You rolled up the mat so far into your house that it's not welcome to anybody. So it's your job to lay the foundation of trying to start that relationship again. So this moment that we're in now around climate for Black Lives was, was really uh, built on the failures of that moment and people realizing that if you're not in right relationship, you can't do the work. At 350, uh, at that time, in addition to signing that letter well before I could ever come there, it paved the way for the right questions for me to join that organization. Uh, they started figuring out 
What is their relationship to community? What are they doing in indigenous space? Uh, what kind of filters do they have? So they built an equity filter for their work, an equity team that measures this, um, the staff, the way the staff is built. Uh, they built a demand for a leader who will be a person of color to do this work, who had to have justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion as a part of their work. But then they also hired a justice and equity department head with a salary, a budget, and staff that helped the whole team to start to think about what their responsibility was. They became an ad hoc equity team that was in every space. So make to make sure that the work and the questions that we're asking about how we do it um, are, are attached to surveys that go out to the partners that we work with. Are we extractive? Are we showing up in the right way? All of that came before they could ever hire a black woman to read their, to lead their program work. And so inside of our organization a couple of things have happened at once but a lot of it was because of work that was happening on the outside demanding that the leadership look like the networks that we're trying to build so i think the lack of relationship failing on the job watching the precursor of what we're going through now in climate change and us failing to meet the mark every time because we don't have any people in our present that we want to see in our future in this work so i know there's a lot that everybody here could say about that but i do think uh, the, the, it has to just, it can't just be a thing that you say and a thing that gets signed. It has to be in the mechanisms and the DNA of the way that your work happens every day. And there has to be continuing accountability for those things that are inside your work plan. That takes us back to the CEO evaluation tool, also coming out of the Green Leadership Trust. It is one of the most important things I've ever spent my life building. It is an equity tool that manages whether or not uh, CEOs are in fact doing that work claiming that money or using the word equity without explaining what the hell that is. So I think that there is a lot, well, we can go a lot further, but work is being done by the engineers in this space. Uh, we are social engineers, not just people sitting here uh, talking about the things we would like to see happen. And the thing that will have to happen for this to be true everywhere is for us to get better budgets, more, run, more room and more people to do it with. Absolutely. <clears throat> Khalil, I hate to do it, but I'm going to make you go after tomorrow again. Yeah, you don't like me, huh? Uh, <laughs> um, no, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. I, I don't, I don't want to say that NRDC hasn't made progress, but then, you know, I, I want to be, be careful to qualify that progress that has been made. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been here for about seven years now, and, and it's changed a great deal in the time that, that I've been here. And I think, you know, like uh, Tamara said at 350, you know, we created uh, an equity screen, equity metric that we, that we are attempting to apply to all of our existing work and any new work, you know, that comes through the pipeline that has to happen, things like that. Um, you know, the, the institution just hired uh, a diversity and equity and inclusion uh, chief, chief executive um, who, who reports directly to the president. Uh, but, but, you know, but he, he's very new, um, you know, and still, you know, getting, you know, the weight of the place and, and still trying to move th those issues around. Um, you know, but, but to me, I always look at it, you know, there, there are sort of two sides of this coin that are related, uh, you know, but also very different. And, and, and one is more of the uh, human resource uh, type issues of, you know, of, you know, staffing, recruitment, you know, retention, et cetera. Um, you know, because, you know, we, we, we found as, as with other organizations, black staff tend to leave uh, faster, tend to leave more often, um, you know, don't last as long. Um, you know, we've also found that, you know, black staff, you know, control, uh, I can't remember what the actual numbers are, but it's a very minuscule portion of the organization's budget. Um, and we are a huge organization with a very huge budget. Um, and, and, you know, the black staff, you know, control very little of that. Um, you know, in the wake of uh, the George Floyd killing and, you know, Breonna Taylor and, and so many others that have happened, you know, throughout the summer and, and into the fall, that, that, that has really galvanized, uh, you know, this current moment, like, like other organizations, you know, they've, um, you know, began to, uh, at least rhetorically, you know, double down on their support, you know, for Black Lives Matter and racial justice and, and, and want to see the intersections be between climate change and racial justice, um, you know, but however, you know, we had to put a bit of a check to that, um, you know, so we organized uh, internally uh, a, a black representative body, an organization called BEST, Black Environmentalists Seeking Transformation, 
uh, so that so that you know we you know can begin to come together and have representation within the organization. Uh, we are also not union. Uh, we have been looking at what's happening at, C at Sierra Club and um, at UCS, so we're very interested in those things, but we're not there yet. Um, and you know, but and you know, one of the things that that we did was you know we had to put a check. You know, anytime the institution sent out communications, um, you know, particularly communications ask, asking for money. Uh, you know, we don't we, we don't want you to say racial justice in your in your communications asking for money because 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 one you know the money that you raise off of that communication and go on to racial justice, uh, you know, to you know the black people that you have here in your organization aren't controlling that that budget. So we ask you to please you know cease and desist on trying to you know mock our communication and mock our language to be able to raise money off off of our communities until you're actually going to commit to actually, actually making those investments. So that's one of the things um, you know that that we that we demanded was to be able to check all of that um you know we are you know in the process of talking with them again you know about uh issues of leadership you know promotion staffing hiring um about putting us uh in position um you know because again you know in the wake of all of this you know we also now have a white allies group uh within the organization uh, who organized and you know who who wanted to come together and, and, and try to learn to be out allies and, and how to speak um, and one of the things we said to them was that yes it's very important you know you can you know do this work you know you have our blessing as long as you know you do it right um, you know but while you are and and, and and rightfully so focusing you know a lot of your attention on our partners and, and the communities outside remember that you have colleagues within this institution. Uh, that are that 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 are going through things that that are pushing that are fighting, uh, and if this organization is going to be able to make this pivot and is is going to be able to shift and, and start to do a little bit more of this work, that there that there's expertise here within the organization that exists, um, and we hope that you will support us, uh, elevate us, um, and lean on us uh, to be able to carry that forward. And so that's what we're trying to do. But again, we're not there yet. We got a, we got a long way to go. Thanks. I'll go to Patrice and then Leslie. Yeah, I, recognizing that we're running, we're running over. I'll, I, I will keep this brief. Um, you know, I think the 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 murder of George Floyd and and all of the other folks that we've seen over the course of many 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 years, um, and and the outrage that that we've rightfully seen emerge around that um, is is transformational. Um, it's been devastating and traumatic for all of us and especially for, for black people across the country. And there's no way to ignore this and there's no way to ignore the hurt and trauma within all of our organizations. Um, and, and, and it really has, in my experience, broken through a barrier um, by virtue of its, its sheer undeniability in terms of the magnitude of the injustice that that particularly that black people face in, in within this country, um, and as this outrage kind of becomes palpable on the streets and in our communities, it's unavoidable that it becomes palpable that that outrage emerges within our organizations. And there is no way for an organization to survive this experience without changing or without reverting back to complete whiteness. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's created this undeniable call to action for two things, I think. One, uh, our organizations, the green organizations, uh, have to examine how anti-blackness manifests and informs how the organizations function, period. And then they've got to fix it. And, and there's just, this is not a point at which that's optional anymore, right? It's either you, you either, either get off the train uh, or, 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 or get to work. And secondly, these organizations and the environmental movement more generally have to come to fully understand how environmental issues and environmental advocacy is inextricably intertwined with the fabric of systemic racism. It, they are not separate things. They are, it is a part of that fabric and we cannot do environmental advocacy of any kind that is just without understanding this interconnection and without being intentional and committed to being an affirmative force for dismantling the architecture of racism generally, right? Not non-racist organizations, anti-racist organizations. It's the only choice. 
Um, you know, as, as Howard Zinn said decades ago, you can't be neutral in a moving train. Uh, and, and, and that's where we are. Yeah, I'm, uh, I want to quote, you know, <clears throat> some of, some of the, the music that's been giving me life lately. You know, we're, we're fighting for freedom now. We're demanding freedom. There's no more asking at this point and beyond. Leslie, you, you to close, and then we're going to do lightning responses for, for the last question. Okay, no fair, no fair. Um, all these great, I'm, I'm just so inspired by my dear friends here. So um, the Sierra Club is the old Hori organization, and um, we have the long, you know, we are old, we're the oldest and we have the longest way to go. We had started, like I'd mentioned, doing dismantling racism, but it was voluntary and it was, the funding was funky and we lost a lot of that funding um, at one point. But since then, um, we have, you know, through a lot of dedicated folks and, and particularly with the environmental justice program, which was, organizers were requested around the country working in those communities, pressuring us and demanding us, demanding that. And I've done a lot of long ago. And so there's been um, different mandatory programs. We have an equity department now. Uh, we've done what's called Growing for Change, which 800 people had to take. Now we have a multi-year equity plan. We have this toolkit for change makers. Every department is supposed to do this work. And now it is baked into people's work plans. You are being evaluated on this work and having a, an, a justice lens, but there's still a lot more to do. And then we, like I mentioned, we have our two unions, which have really made such a huge difference. Um, and, um, but when um, George Floyd was murdered, there really was like a reckoning as everyone has been saying. And for the black staff, I mean, nothing, nothing in my opinion, my life, nothing has really changed the only difference is, is that now we have these on our phones. We have cameras on our phones and our people have been lynched since forever. And now it's on the phone and you can see it. All right. And now everybody is, I, t I stood up at one point and I said um, in a meeting, I never heard white people talk about white supremacy in the Sear Club until Donald Trump got elected. All right. As if it didn't exist. And the systemic racism has to be addressed, not just about Donald Trump. We just want to get rid of Donald Trump, and that's magically racism. I think it's going to be magically delicious. Uh, and so we have to be really careful about these organizations because it is it is that is the easy, comfortable way for them, and not to look at the internal um, pieces and the internal work that they need to do, or the man in the mirror. I like to say my favorite Michael Jackson song, right? So. We now have, um, I, I convened after George Floyd died, an all black staff call. We had 66 people get on, national staff, chapter staff, and volunteers. We had never seen each other before. We were crying, we were falling out of our chairs. These people's beautiful black faces were popping up. It was a watershed moment for me. Uh, and there was also had been a letter to, from, um, young black women, um, young women of color and femmes of color a couple of years ago, which also, you know, we've had many of these interventions, but it was uh, the reckoning. And so now we have a black action team out of it. We have BIPOC managers, we have BIPOC staff meetings. Um, what I'm very proud about our black action team is that they, um, they didn't ask the first, one of their first, the first demand that they made of the Sierra Club wasn't about retribution, or any reparations or revenge, they wanted resources for healing. And that we need healing. I need some therapy, all right? I mean, we need healing. We need to be supported. And this is part of the work that has to go on in these organizations. We are just a microcosm of the rest of society. You know, we're not special, we're not better. We're not work, we're just a microcosm. So as we are tearing down our monuments to John Muir, you know, when the article from the Washington Post came out about John Muir, I got emails saying, oh, you've thrown John Muir under the bus. And I was like, you can't throw a dead person under the bus. I just might have been dead, right? And, you know, so having, I don't even waste time in those conversations anymore. But 
the, I am very proud of um, the hard work that's been done in turn. We have a long way to go, but when, um, and I think that there's so many great, we are, we are particularly in concert with communities, everybody on this call, everybody in this conference, all right, and many, many, many people out there who we all work with around the world, um, we are in accord and we're going to prevail because um, it is really, truly not just the right thing to do or the nice thing to do. It is about exact, it is about our humanity and the um, way we're going to heal and keep protecting our planet is through justice and through environmental justice. And so um, it's very exciting um, and challenging, but I, you know, always, when, whenever I see these great people, talk to them and the others who are listening to us and everyone else out there working very, very hard, we're going to, we're going to prevail. And um, I'm just thanking everyone for spending the time this afternoon with us. Thank you. It, it's been a pleasure and a joy. Uh, I wanted the last question to end a, positive, a strongly positive note in terms of hopes for the future, recommendations. Um, how do we level up? How do we transform and, and get to, to Jedi 3.0, 4.0, 5.0? Um, where these, these systems, these principles are, are integrated from the start. So these will be just quick 30 second thoughts on, on that. Well, we'll start quickly. We're, we're combining a lot. Of, we had been asked to endorse um, the Movement of Black Lives, some legislation. So now we brought a consultant on, um, some of you may know, called the Mayor's II, who, and I know Tamara and then went to law school together um, to look at these intersections of criminal justice equals environmental justice, looking at how through the research um, work that other groups are doing like 350 and we're doing and looking at private equity being funding these police foundations. And when we talk about divest, what do we want to invest in? We want to invest in all the great work that everyone is doing in their communities. We want to invest in health, invest in healthy communities and invest in all these solutions. So that's where the, um, I think that's where the, uh, the pr proactive work is going to happen. Mustafa, can you repeat the question because you faded out? I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. So recommendations, solutions. Um, how do we move on into the future with Jedi? Well, I'll, I'll take a different approach. One, we have to make sure that we are, are better uh, funding and working in authentic partnerships with young people, um, which sometimes uh, can also be a you know, it's almost like a window dressing moment for some folks. So we got to make sure that we're not doing that. And then I'll also say that we need to work more effectively with creatives in helping to make this change happen that everybody is going to talk about um, and make sure that that is authentic as well. Thanks. Khalil. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be like, time of easy coats. I don't have a whole lot of optimism. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, more optimistic today uh, in the energy um, of the social movements. Um, you know, I was just on a call yesterday with, um, you know, Movement for Black Gr Black Lives, who are develop developing um, a, a red, black, and green New Deal platform. Um, and after the long week that I had, you know, that was that that was gorgeous. You know, to be able to be a part of that conversation and to be able to soak up that energy. Um, and so, you know, the energy. Um, of, of that movement, you know, overall, but the energy of that movement bringing it into, into this space, um, you know, I am very excited uh, to be able to learn from them and to be able to work with them um, and to be able to carry their messages uh, into, you know, the corridors uh, that I sometimes have to lurk in. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Thanks. Adrian. Yeah, sh short and sweet. We need to really start putting people and the planet first over profits from pollution and poisoning our, our um, people. That's it in a nutshell. Therese. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, you, you know, I think, I think the way I want to end is with some, some timeless words of wisdom that, that are, of course, not mine. Um, Change will come if we remember that
that power concedes nothing without demand. Freedom and justice is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And freedom, importantly, is never more than a generation away from extinction. We remember those things and we keep fighting. We'll get there. Absolutely. And finally, Tamara. I can be brief. Trust Black women and resource them accordingly. Boom. That's all we need. So thank you all panelists for this incredible session. Um, this is the, the best way, the only way we could have ended this year's symposium. Um, so a, a round of applause virtually. No, you guys can't hear it, but it's, it's ringing in my, in my ears and I'm sure everyone else's. Um, thank you, Jan. Thank you so much. So with that, oh, I see Dr. Wilson. Are you gonna bring us home? I got, okay. Yeah, so, you start out in, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I opened today talking about the, wh how far we've come this, the, just this year. Uh, I mean, how far we, we've all come as, as who we are and, and in our space and in our skin over the course of these last six, seven months. But just in the, in the, in the span of these four weeks, all of the topics that we have discussed from COVID-19, from the systemic of COVID-19, systemic racism and climate crisis, climate inequity, uh, moving on to Jackie Patterson's liberation theology, the, you know, our, our crash course in liberation, um, and also putting, putting our government affected, elected, oh, maybe affected, elected officials and appointed officials uh, to task, or not, uh, let me tell you, I'm getting a little too excited, maybe but putting them forward so that they can be accountable for what they've done and what they haven't done. Um, and then last week, the NAACP climate leaders, uh, climate justice leaders panel, um, from, from talking about grassroots efforts all across the country to today's um, youth panel, which actually echoed a lot of what, well, I guess you guys were the echoers here, uh, a lot of what was said tonight here was first said originally um, this morning in the powerful youth justice, um, youth leaders and environmental justice movement panel. So thankful for that. And then of course, you know, to close it off with this discussion, um, on a, and, I, and I can't forget, you know, the, the incredible panel about the National Black Environmental Justice Network, the reforming, the, almost like, you know, the reassembling of the Avengers. So there's just been incredible depth, incredible breadth over these last four weeks. And I am privileged, I think we're all privileged to have been a part of it, to be, to be here in this moment, to not just speak our truths and hear each other's truths, but um, you know, just enjoy and embrace the family that has been uh, this symposium and as it will continue to be. Uh, and speaking of family, another shout out to the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, which started this program this afternoon and we'll continue on in, in the next two weeks. Um, so with that, Dr. Wilson, I will let you uh, close us out. Yeah, thank you, Yen. Uh, just, just real quick, I just wanna say thank you first, first of everyone who uh, shared the kind words and thoughts uh, to Natasha, lost of her mother. So we attend memorial service today. So that's part of the reason why I wasn't able to be present all day, but in the, in those, you know, thinking about that, we are here because of our ancestors. We're here because we're a family. I just want to make sure we continue to move forward as a family. And, you know, the last comment I'll make is, you know, uh, one of the things, one of the programs in my fraternity, I'm an alpha of voteless peoples of hopeless people. So everybody needs to vote. I'm not telling you to vote for, you know, what person to vote for, but I'm telling you to vote for environmental justice, vote for climate justice, Vote for reparations. Vote for people who are going to be there to have your back. Vote for folks who are really folks on public health. Vote for folks who are not going to be pimping people's pain. Let's vote for a democracy that works for the people. Other people, for the people, by the people. That's what we're talking about. So it's very important that we vote, but after you vote, hold them accountable. We have to be more actively engaged in the democracy. To make a democracy work, it takes work. So this symposium is part of that process, creates that space, but we have to keep moving forward 
with action. Less talk, more walking, y'all. We gotta be. We gotta fight. We gotta struggle. This is this pandemic, right, Adrian? Life release, four hundred plus years. It's gonna take us working together to really make this change happen. And I appreciate this last word. Everybody's talking about humanity. We got to make sure we recognize our shared humanity as we move forward. So I'm going to end there. I won't get too emotional like I did a couple of weeks ago, but I really appreciate everyone's, you know, taking that time, this extra time today, and really contributing to, to the symposium, but also being part of this movement. And remember, this movement is about family. This movement is about hope. This movement has to be about love. Because without that, what do we have? So, so thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day today. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, family. We'll post Thank recordings you, to the website um, as soon as possible, definitely by the end of next week. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay. Let's do Let's it again. Bye. I want your Bye -bye. Coltrane poster. Okay.